From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Welcome to another John Hannam Meets. My guest today actually has been on our TV screens, I can't believe this, for about 50 years. He's loved by fans of Shakespeare, Star Wars and many others. It's the wonderful Oliver Ford Davies. Thank nice you. to meet you. Very nice to be here. <laughs> and we're in Chichester, which is rather appropriate because you're in the Chalk Garden until June 16. Yes. And that's sort of set in Sussex, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, yes. very appropriate then. Yes. The, the author lived at Rottingdean, so, which I know, I know quite well. So. Before we start, you just let a secret out to me that last week you went to the Isle of Wight on an adventure. I did. I had the whole day and the evening off, and I thought, where shall I go as an adventure? So I went to the Isle of Wight. My interest particularly was, as a child, uh, we went for summer holidays to Shanklin and Ventnor. So I thought, I'll go and visit Shanklin and Ventnor. So I got the ferry, which turned out to be extremely expensive, (laughs) um, to uh, Fishbourne, and I drove down to uh, Shanklin and Ventnor and had lunch there and also visited Sandown and um, got myself back intact. So I was very pleased about that. Wonderful. So it was a a worthwhile adventure. It was an adventure, yes. Yeah. Ventnor is particularly interested me because I discovered some years ago that in the 19th century it was very popular as a watering place and, uh, and people went for the bathing and for the air. But it was also a centre of Russian emigres who presumably felt very safe from Tsarist spies. This is about 1870. Tsarist spies were never going to get to the Isle of Wight and to Ventnor. And, in fact, Tom Stoppard's play, The Coast of Utopia, sets a number of scenes in Ventnor among the Russian emigres, yes. You can always learn something. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) When you were about 11, Oliver, you did a school play, and I suppose, in a way, that almost decided your future, did it? Well... Yes, I, I, I realised that I, I really liked being somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that was my discovery. And uh, yes, I suppose from the age of 11, I nursed a secret desire to become an actor. But because I was very good at passing exams and thought that I was going to be a teacher, my, my father was um, an English teacher all mm. his life at the Latimer Upper School in Hammersmith. And he was very keen on the theatre, and he took me to the theatre a lot. So in a way, I followed my father's interest, A, in teaching, and B, in in the theatre. I know you got a scholarship to Merton College at Oxford. Yes. When I interviewed the late Sir Roger Bannister a few oh, yes. years ago, he went to Merton College. He did. I know. Yeah. Was he there before you? I, oh, I well, yes. yes. <laughs> no. Well, I suppose only about... Ten years before right. me, that's quite true. I was there with, of all people, Chris Christopherson. Were you? Chris Christopherson was a Rhodes Scholar. At uh, 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 There were a number of Americans there who uh, on Rhodes Scholarship, and I played Frisbee in Merton College Garden with Chris Christopherson. Ball games were forbidden. But the senior common room couldn't decide whether a frisbee was allowed or not. <laughs> and after three weeks, they decided that it was a ball and it was, it was not allowed. <laughs> when you saw him in that mega movie with Barbara Streisand, yes. did it sort of take you back a It bit? did. Very nice man, Chris Christopherson. Very bright. You were the president of the Oxford University yes. Dramatic Society. That was, was quite an honour, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I suppose so, <laughs> yes. Yes. I know then, of course, you became a lecturer, didn't you? Yes. Before you became an actor. You went to Edinburgh, I think. Yes. To my surprise, I I got a grant to do um, a PhD, or as Oxford called them, a DPhil. And then they said, well, and I was still hankering after becoming an actor. And they said, well, it'd be very helpful for you if you ever wanted to go back into teaching to get a job. And the second job I applied for at Edinburgh, I got. So I became an an assistant history lecturer at uh, Edinburgh University. And um, after three weeks, I have what I call my my Damascene moment. Uh, I thought, this isn't actually what I want to do with my life. And I thought, I'd be very happy staying as a history lecturer 
in Edinburgh. Why leave? Wonderful city, wonderful university, great history department. And um, I talked to my professor, who was very sympathetic, and said, if I were you, I'd go now, because once you get maybe a mortgage and a family, you won't go. So <laughs> after two years, I left and uh, plied my trade as an actor. Oliver, just four days ago, I was in London with Roger Allen. Yes. And he told me that his earliest influence was Paul Schofield. Yes. And I think you thought the world of Paul Schofield. I did, indeed. And I saw his King Lear uh, in 1962, three times. And I did eventually act with Paul in Heartbreak House in 1992. Um, he was a very nice man, but v kept himself really very much to himself and turned down ever so many jobs, particularly in films. Um, he'd won an Oscar for the uh, Henry VIII uh, Thomas More film. But I learnt a lot from him in a way. Um, I wish he'd done more, but no, he kept himself to himself. So 1967 found you at the Birmingham Rep? Yes. <laughs> there were a few people that went on, like you, to enjoy great careers, yes? Well, we, we, uh, Peter Dews, uh, who later uh, uh, ran Chichester for a while, Peter Dews had taken over the year before, and he decided to have a very young company. And um, it, so there was uh, uh, Brian Cox, uh, Michael Gambon, uh, Timothy Dalton, Anna Calder Marshall, and a lot of other very good young actors. Uh, we, we we did a number of middle-aged plays, which I think was a bit ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we we did thrive, and I, I did learn a lot. I know you did some early TV. I think in one one of your first ones, it was in a documentary called Omnibus, and you played about three parts: a bailiff, a bishop, and a doctor. Do you remember that? Goodness, uh, do, you, I, I, do you know what it was called? I get very. Hazy I think it was it. called Hadrian the Seventh. I think. Ah, Hadrian the Seventh was a play that I did first of all at Birmingham. Yes. Uh, with Alec McCowan, and then I did it in London for a year. So. Um, Yes, that's perfectly true, that, uh, that you play a bailiff and a bishop and he becomes a cardinal, that's quite right. Then you did the time of your life when you played a lecturer, which was uh, <laughs> what you were a you year ago. What I was, yes, yes. I, curious enough, because I've been a university teacher, I've played very few university teachers. Um, I, I, I often think... Um, it's rather like the army, you know, if you say, well, I'm a motor mechanic, they say, oh, well, you'll be a cook then. And if you're a cook, they say, <laughs> you'll be a motor mechanic, you know. In a strange way, you appeared in Father Brown many years ago. I when, did. When Kenneth Moore. Yes. And of course, now you've played... I, I played it more recently. Yes. And when I said to people, well, the last Father Brown I did was, I think, 1971. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they looked aghast. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I remember that. Kenneth Moore, of course, was uh, starring in that one, I think. Yes, he was, yeah. he was. Not a very probable Father Brown, to tell you the truth, because he was a sort of large, handsome, uh, you know, matinee idol kind of person. Uh, I, I think quite poor casting, actually, for Father Brown. Crown Court was one of the early ones where you played more than one episode, wasn't it? I think you did two or three episodes. Of? Of Crown Court. Of Crown Court, yes, I did. I did. And on one, or the, I think I was an antique dealer, but I was also a faith healer. And I learned a rather worrying thing about juries on that. Right. Because the, the jury, as you know, in Crown Court, the, the 11 people are members of the public and the foreman or forewoman has to be a professional actor because they speak. Anyway, the, uh, the producer told me that, uh, that they were very divided about me and that one woman had said, I think he's innocent, but there is only one faith healer, and that is Jesus Christ, so I'm going to find him guilty. And I thought, that is a very worrying thing about our jury system, I thought. <laughs> of course, in the current play, which we'll talk about later, you play a judge anyway, yes. don't you? Tenko was a massive series. And yes. You were a priest, weren't you? Yes, I've played an awful lot of priests. <laughs> um, the, the only way I could get in among these women was to be uh, a Roman Catholic priest who I think had to tell 
the sister that she had to leave. So, yes, I enjoyed doing that. That was in the 1980s. Uh, in Citadel, you were a reverend in that, the Reverend Parry, I think. Yes, yeah. I, uh, yes, playing Welsh. Uh, my name, Davis, with an E, is Welsh, but we were Welsh a long way back. And the director said, I have thrust you in among the Welsh mafia. In other words, <laughs> I was the only sort of non-Welsh actor <laughs> in it, which was very frightening, particularly as I had to deliver a kind of hellfire sermon, I remember. Oliver, you did all the sort of big series, Morse, Vandervelt, May mm. Grey, Wycliffe, Heartbeat, all those sort of yes. big series. Yes. Did you enjoy going into sort of successful series as a guest in a way, weren't you? Uh, yes. It's never entirely satisfactory because often you only do three or four days, so just as you're getting to know the people, you finish. But uh, I did enjoy those. I did an episode of Heartbeat, and you started in Leeds, and we did lots of location shots outside Leeds, and then we moved to the North Yorkshire Moors, and the day afterwards, eight inches of snow came down. Gosh. So, of course, nothing matched from the locations that we'd done outside Leeds to the locations <laughs> we were doing in eight, eight <laughs> inches of snow. And I always remember the director saying to the props people, um, could you sweep some of that snow away? And we, we gazed out over the North Moors covered with snow. And the poor props person said, how much of it do you want me to sweep away, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> Peter Fox got QC. You were yeah. head of chambers. That was a, yeah. a great breakthrough, Kavanagh QC, wasn't yes. it? With John Thor, of course. Yes. Yeah. Looking back on that, was that a, a good turning point in your career? Yes, I, I suppose it was. I did a lot of television as a result of that. Curiously enough, I'd worked with John Thor quite a lot because not only had I done a Morse, I'd done a play with him at uh, uh, Stratford in 1983. He played Wolsey in Henry VIII, and I was his sort of sidekick, Gardner. And then in 1983, no, 1993... Uh, I did the David Hare play The Absence of War, in which I played kind of Charles Clark to his Neil Kinnock. So I had worked with John, oddly enough, um, quite a lot. Uh, so they, it was a, uh, a good relationship. Well, recently, of course, Game of Thrones. Yes. I very foolishly killed myself after about 10 minutes of screen time. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a mega series. Hasn't yes, it, it has. <laughs> it has, yes. Put that light out! I'm trying to relax and listen to John Hannum. Currently, I'm at Chichester, actually, with Oliver Ford Davis, who is in the Chalk Garden yes. until June 16. So. C.O. C.O. Bibble. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you find being in Star Wars sort of you go to conventions and you get lots of people want to talk about it? I, I do occasionally go to conventions. I, I've turned down uh, a lot, particularly in, in America, but I have been to odd ones. I went to one in Germany a year ago. Yes, and I continue to get mail First of all, it was all from America, but increasingly it's been from Europe. And oddly enough, in the, just the last couple of years, quite a lot from Russia. So obviously Russia have got into Star Wars as well. Uh, yes. The governor of Naboo. Wasn't I was it? the governor of Naboo. That's, that's quite right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, the 19-year-old Natalie Portman was Queen Amidala, and I was her governor. That's right. And we filmed her palace at the, the, the Royal Palace of the Kings of Naples, which is just about 15 miles outside Naples, and is almost entirely made of marble. It has 60 different kinds of marble in it. Yes. I heard you once relate a wonderful story when you were looking for a model of your character. Oh, yes. And you tried to get it in London, and you yes. couldn't. That's right. Uh, the models came out in batches, and I didn't expect to be one of me. And then um, a friend of my daughter's who was working in Selfridges said, oh, your, your, your dad's in. And uh, my daughter Miranda said, oh, we'll put one by. She said, oh, I can't do that. That's more than my job's worth. So uh, they'd all went. I went to Hamleys. There were none there. I was going to America 
and then Japan with the RSC. And they said, oh, you'll, um, you'll find them in America. So I went to the main toy shop in New York, F.O. Schwartz, and they had a room devoted to Star Wars. And as I walked in, I was actually on the screen. They were showing Star Wars a continuous loop, you see. And I said, do, do you have any C.O. Bibble figures? And the woman <laughs> said, oh, that's very rare. No, I, I, that's a collector's piece. No, I don't think we've got any of those. And then rather foolishly, in my very English accent, I said, you see, I, I, I am C.O. Bibble. <laughs> And the woman looked at me pityingly. She thought, oh, my goodness, they come in here. They say they're Darth Vader. Now I've got this ancient British actor come in, say he's C.O. Bibble. You know. Anyway, so uh, none in America. And then we went to Tokyo. And after a week, there at the stage door uh, were three people with, with these figures. I said, where did, you, where did you get those? And they said, oh, Kitty Land uh, on Omoto Sando. And I went down there, and there were racks and racks of CO Bibbles who obviously had all, for some reason, got to Tokyo, and nobody was buying them. I don't think. <laughs> Your character was one of the first to sort of suspect that the invasion was coming, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Yes, somebody very early on asked me, What was your favourite line? And of course, actors, particularly doing film and television, are very used that to wiping the text almost immediately from your brain because you're taking in more text, you see. I couldn't remember a single line. Unfortunately, she said to me, oh, my, my, my favourite line is, um, a communications disruption can only mean one thing, invasion. I said, oh, I'll remember that. So when people ask me my favourite <laughs> line, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> did you do some sort of blue screenshots? I did on the second one. Because Is that difficult? I, well, this one was particularly difficult. I couldn't go to Naples because I was in a play at the time. And they said, we'll do blue screen in Ealing Studios, of all places. I, I, I grew up in Ealing. I thought, and I, when in the 1950s, it was the heyday of Ealing Studios, all the comedies. I thought, I can't believe I'm doing Star Wars in Ealing Studios. But... <laughs> They were going to insert me into a certain scene and I had to walk up some stairs and they'd put um, a, an extra in as me and they said, then we will digitally put you in instead of the extra. I said, fine. And they said, but however, you have to walk up this staircase and we've, we've made a wooden staircase exactly like the marble one. Okay, but you have to walk up it in 15 and a quarter seconds. So I said, OK. So I did it. They said, no, 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 that was 16 seconds. That's much too long. So I, I said, oh, quicker, quicker. No, 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 that, that was 14 and three quarter seconds. That was it. But eventually I did manage to walk up this wooden staircase in 15 and a quarter seconds. And then they put me into the film. <laughs> when you look back, you did Scandal. Yes. Uh, Defence of the Realm, Sense and Sensibility, Mrs. Brown, Johnny yes. English, The Mother. Done lots of sort of successful movies, haven't you? I, yes, yes, I have. I mean, with, the thing about movies is you never know whether they're going to be successful. I mean, if you're doing a Star Wars, the box office takings are going to be huge. The other ones you don't know. Mrs. Brown, actually, started off as just a film for television. And curious enough, it was Harvey Weinstein who saw the television film and said, I can make this into a feature film. Wow. Um, and so it turned into a feature film and did very well, yeah. You were the Dean of Windsor in that one? I, I was, that's right. I was sort of, although Anglicans don't have confessors, I was kind of Queen Victoria's confessor. We, we have letters between Queen Victoria and the Dean of Windsor that show that she went to him for advice, really. Live theatre, of course. You, you've done all the Shakespeare classics, I know. You did King Lear and you wrote a book about it. I did, you? yes. Yes, I did King Lear at the Almeida Theatre in 2002. That's right, yeah. You obviously enjoy Shakespeare. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I do. No, it's, it's very challenging. It's very hard work. Uh, I remember one season at Stratford, I was in five of the six main house plays. And when we finished rehearsing the, the last one, after a sort of period, I think, for about seven months of continuous rehearsal, I thought, do you know, 
I don't sit down in any of these five plays. <laughs> There's an awful lot of standing in Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> you also did Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yes. Love Dave was lost. And uh, good night, Mr. Tom. We mentioned John Thorpe. Yes. Of course, he did the movie. He did. But you played him in the play, didn't you? Yes, which opened here at Chichester yes. in 2011. And I did that. I did two tours of that. And we did do a run in the West End at the at the Phoenix Theatre. I can remember because John did it while we were still doing Kavanagh. And I, re- I remember saying to John the, how good I thought his performance was. I said, your accent was very good. In typical John fashion, he said, I worked bloody hard on that <laughs> accent, he said. Um, every week we would do a question and answer with the audience. And I did get used to people saying... Uh, did you model your performance on John Thor's? <laughs> that gets a bit annoying. And one person actually said, I didn't think you'd be as good as John Thor, but you were just about, he said. <laughs> <laughs> the first time it was ever seen on TV, Michelle McGorian was living on the Isle of Wight at that time. Oh, yes. In a place called Bembridge. And I yes. can always remember ringing her up about 10 minutes after I'd seen it just yes. to say, I can't believe how brilliant this was. You know? <laughs> oh, that's... Yes, she now lives somewhere near Petersfield. Yes, she does. She does, yes. But very, very nice woman. Audiobility, you've always been keen on sort of, well, actors speaking out, yes. don't you? Yes. I find... Um, Oliver, these days, sometimes when you go to a play, if it's got TV stars that haven't had the experience of some of you guys, it's not always easy to pick them up. No. One of the problems, yes, in, in, in film and television is that actors who are going very hard for what they call naturalism... I, I remember a sound guy saying to me, yeah, they call it naturalism, we call it inaudibility. But the problem is with naturalism is that if you mumble somewhat, it doesn't matter how much the sound person turns up the volume, it doesn't become more audible. And both actors and directors often think, oh, the sound people will sort that out, they'll make that audible. Well, you can't make it audible. You know, if you're talking a bit longer, so you know. It doesn't matter how loud you make that, it's still not decipherable. <laughs> One of my favourite stories of yours, because obviously we all know acting is rather precarious. Yeah. And apparently in 1984, you were having a bit of a lull. Yes. And you, you, you were delivering junk mail to rich people, is that? That's true, I was. I, and I, I was cleaning people's houses as well. And, and to my great surprise, I was sent to clean the house of Cicely Courtnage and Jack Hulbert, <laughs> no. which probably means n- nothing to younger listeners, but to older listeners, uh, Jack Hulbert was a great uh, star of stage comedy, and Cicely Courtnage was a, a musical star. Yes, and I, I didn't really want to say to them, I'm an out-of-work actor. They looked <laughs> at me very suspiciously, I remember. <laughs> I've just walked up. Chichita High Street, and I've walked under a banner which says the Chalk Garden. Yeah. Penelope Keith, Amanda Root, Oliver Ford Davis. Yeah. So, talk about the Chalk Garden. So, it's sort of a proven play, isn't it? It is. It's a very odd play in some ways, or a one off. And it was first done in this country in 1956. And curiously enough, I saw it. I was about 16, I suppose. I, I don't have great memories of it, but it was, uh, I, I mean, I don't remember it very well. Uh, Edith Evans, and originally Peggy Ashcroft, but I think uh, somebody else had taken over by the time I saw it. And I haven't seen it since, but it has been revived every now and again. The uh, Chichester did it a while back with Dorothy Tutin and Googie Withers. And it was done at the Don Mar about 10 years ago uh, with Penelope Wilton and Margaret Tyzak. And it's usually been successful when done. It's a kind of high-style comedy in a way, uh, but quite profound also with a certain thriller element to it. It's, it's a great mixture of genres in that way. I, I, I find the play very interesting. And it's perfect for this venue, really, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. Yes, because it's set in Sussex. It, in, in, uh, yes. So looking back, um, you could have been a teacher, you could have been a lecturer, you yes. changed careers. And yes. a <laughs> wonderful idea, wasn't it, really? 
Uh, well, when I've been out of work and, and doing near rubbish, I've sometimes thought my life would be more worthwhile if I were a teacher. But I think probably I made the right decision. And a number of my fellow academics do say to me, yes, I, I think you made the right decision, <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any ambitions left? Some older actors have always wanted to play King Lear, but you've done that. I've anyway. done King Lear. Yes. Yes. yes, so have you got any burning ambitions? Um, uh, well, the two Shakespeare parts that people have often said to me, I'm surprised you haven't played them, which I suppose I still would quite like to play, uh, are Prospero and uh, Malvolio. But I'm, I'm a bit old for both of them now, I think. So uh, wh where I'm very grateful is that film and television are not greatly interested in men and women over 70, uh, particularly with women. Eileen I, I, Atkins has said to me, oh, I, I just get fed up with all these scripts that come to me. I'm in a care home or I've got dementia or whatever, you know. Uh, but fortunately, playwrights have often written good parts for older men and women. So um, I've been doing quite a lot of theatre of late. You're not going to retire, are you? Well, actors don't retire. No, I, I mean, one of the very few benefits of uh, being an actor is they do actually want you at all ages, they think, well, we'd better get a 70-year-old to play the 70-year-old part. In the days of rep, you used to do what they call grey up. You would grey up. Yes. Oh, I greyed up my hair. I can't tell you for 20 years. I got very expert at it. <laughs> but now, now we do use 70-year-old actors. Just before you go, what do you do right away when you're not acting, Oliver? What's your sort of turn-off other than an adventure to the Isle of Wight then? <laughs> well, I, I have been writing uh, in the last 10 years quite a lot. I had a book out last year, Shakespeare's Fathers and Daughters, which uh, Bloomsbury Arden published, and that took me seven years to write. So a lot of my spare time was taken up uh, r writing that. I do do a certain amount of what they call master classes and workshops and lectures and all that. I have a, uh, I go to the University of York about every year to do to do. Uh, one of those. But my other interests, well, I, I'm, I'm quite interested in carpentry, actually. I'm interested in history still. I still read uh, history. And I quite like gardening. So, uh, but I don't have, it's true, very, very strong interests outside acting and writing. Yeah. So here at Chichester until the June 16 in the Chalk Garden. And it's a must-see production, isn't well, it? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Oliver, can I thank you for your time? I love what I call real actors, and you're certainly a real actor. You've been there and you've done it. I've been there, all right, yes. And <laughs> you're not as close to the microphone as some of my guests, which is yes. fantastic. It proves that, uh, well, you're a real actor and yes. they can hear you in the back row or yes. in the gallery in the old days, I guess. I did a play in, in, in a very large space, and a man came up to me afterwards who was later told was a Russian conductor, but I don't know which which one. And he said to me, "You, my friend, have a voice that can split bricks. <laughs> you should be singing Alberic in the Ring." And I thought, well, start with the easy ones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> can I wish your career continued success <laughs> and uh, good health in the future? Thank you very much. It's great, he's got a swell personality He meets and greets the stars with such amenity Good enough to make you coming out of the street John Hanna That's right That was a memorable day in Chichester The weather was fantastic Their press officer, Lucinda Morrison, looked after me so well as ever And Oliver Ford Davis was a perfect guest Doesn't get much better than that Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.